It makes a difference, doesn't it? Having everyone together singing. You can hear the difference, the wonder of the gathered voices of God's people praising His holy and eternal name uh, for the great things that He has done. And what a privilege and what a joy it is to be here uh, this morning uh, with you, uh, worshiping with you uh, to the honor of His name. Please, once you turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12, immediately after the, the service we'll be having communion, or after the sermon rather, and then we'll close with a song after communion. But what you'll notice is that a lot of the songs that Matt has chosen have reflected the truths that we're going to be hearing about this morning, the truth that uh, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins, and Christ's blood and Christ's blood alone is what can shield us from the wrath of God, and we're going to see that in very clear detail uh, as we turn to the text now. And it won't, won't be a long message, it'll be a simple message, and if, if there are children here and there are a number, I'm sure that you can follow this, and I'm sure you can understand, and maybe your parents can ask you about it on the way home in the car, or when you gather for family worship at some point in the day, just to uh, commemorate uh, this day on which we remember the Lord's death. Exodus chapter 12, I'll read verses 1 to 13, and then I'll pray and begin. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each, of, each can eat, uh, you shall make count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat in any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and, all the and on all the gods of Egypt I will exe execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Let us pray. Our great God, it is in the name of your beloved Son that we come now and ask that your Holy Spirit would restrain uh, any mind, any thoughts, any affections that may wander from you now and that you would bring us to the place of silence and hearing and receptivity as we sit under your holy word. Please, Lord, take simple truths and apply them deeply within us so that they might bear the fruit of righteousness in our lives as we depend on your Son. Amen. In the early hours of the 29th of May, 1943, a surprise attack by Japanese soldiers fell upon an American military camp in the Aleutian Islands just off Alaska. They had no interest in taking prisoners. The stated objective was to kill as many as possible before expecting to be killed themselves, unless, of course, they happened to win, which was the case now. The Allied encampment was surrounded, entirely overrun, and every soldier within it killed, carnage and death all around, with only the victorious enemy alive, exploring and searching and resting and killing uh, any wounded survivors they may find. 
However, in the darkness and morning fog, they did not realize that one of the tents in the camp was in fact an aid tent, a hospital tent filled still with wounded American soldiers that had escaped. One whom later, who was in that tent later gave a terrifying but remarkable account of what happened next, recorded as follows. It was light enough now for the eyes accustomed to the darkness inside the tent to distinguish more than just lumps and shadows. The tent was a mess. It had been riddled with bullets, and the stove and stovepipes were full of holes. Of the 13 men in the tent, four were still able to move about. Captain Bueller had miraculously escaped being hit at all. Captain Bryce had been creased across his eyebrows, and one aid man who had been sleeping outside and had somehow managed to get inside without being seen or hit. The exposure case, who had been stripped and was sleeping near the stove, had been killed on the stretcher. The top of his head was a mess where a bullet had ripped into his skull. His face was bloody and brain tissue was splattered over the litter. A boy who had been hit trying to get out of the tent was moaning, I'm hit in the heart, I can't, can't, I can't last long. And Sergeant Onken, who had been hit in the leg, was desperately trying to quiet him. They were both in the end of the tent near the stove. The rest of the men were at the other end of the tent. It was darker there away from the flapping doorway. The enemy outside seemed to have thinned out. Their chatter had subsided, but there were still many of them around. Captain Bryce crawled to the dead man on the litter. Cautiously, he moved his body toward the door. The tactics were simple. The aid station had escaped complete annihilation by a miracle. By a miracle, 12 men were still living. Only one was dead and 12 were playing dead. Bryce pulled the mutilated man halfway off the stretcher and left him sprawled face up in the doorway so that any curious Japanese who peered inside would see this first and perhaps only this and accept the grisly testimony at its face value. Bryce had just completed setting the precarious stage and had crawled back to the doorway from the doorway when the effectiveness of his work proved itself. An enemy soldier pulled back the flap of the door and peered in. He glanced at the dead man's head and withdrew, satisfied that the destruction inside had been complete. Five times during the morning, the enemy pulled back the tent flap and looked in, and each time they were driven back, the sight of the dead boy convinced them. He will never be sighted for valor, but the mutilated dead soldier held his position against the door of the tent more valiantly and more effectively than he could have in life. And to the 12 live men in the tent, he was a hero. Now many of you can see where I'm going with this and you can see the obvious limitations as well. And I'll speak to that. At this point, I just ask that you keep the heart of the matter plainly before you. The simple truth. The bloody body that stood in the gap turned away their wrath, which is remarkably like something the Bible itself is very clear about. Blood turns away wrath. A substitute must be offered in order for the sinner to be forgiven, says Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin. In other words, you want to escape the threat of God's judgment, blood must be shed. Someone must stand between you and him and die so that you may live. And this is the picture that is seen throughout the Bible. Uh, you, you could even start in Genesis 3, immediately after mankind fell into sin. What does God do? He kills some animals. He clothes, he covers the nakedness of Adam and Eve before he sends them away. But where the imagery really starts to get clear is in the Passover, something that Jews are celebrating right now, by the way. It's where we start this morning in Exodus 12, and this is my first point. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And you know the story, right? I mean, the children here know the story. They can tell you after the service if you ask them. The nation of Israel is in chains and captivity, slaves to a cruel pharaoh. And God has sent Moses to call for their release, yet Pharaoh refuses. So what happens? A series of devastating plagues, judgment, each more terrifying than, lo than the last, is, is unleashed against Egypt. The plagues strike at everything that Egypt holds dear. 
against their food supply, against the Nile River, against their comfort, against their economy, against the the whole pantheon of their pagan gods. But the most terrible, the most final plague was still to come, and it was announced in chapter 11 of Exodus where God said, "And, and about midnight I will go into the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn born of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And it is in preparation for that last threatened, promised plague, that final judgment on Egypt, that Israel has to make these Passover preparations in chapter 12 that we read about. Every family must take a lamb, one without defect, one without blemish, and kill it, and then take the blood of that lamb and smear it upon the doorframe and the lintels entering into their home. Together with this, they had to get dressed, get ready, and get fed rushing to do so because the next morning they would have to leave immediately out to leave Egypt and to go to the promised land. And so this became known as the Passover feast. Why? What was the urgency? And what was the blood of the lamb going to do? How was it going to help them? Verse 12 of our text this morning, God said, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Uh, do, Do you see? When he sees the blood... Judgment passes over them. When he sees the the stark, screaming, scarlet red, staining and dripping at the sides of the doorpost, a reminder of that violent death of the Lamb, judgment passes over them. The blood turns away his wrath. Which also tells you, by the way, that Israel is no more innocent than the Egyptians. I mean, they had to take refuge in the blood of a sacrificial lamb whilst they would face the same judgment that the Egyptians were facing. The only reason they were spared was because of God's grace, His total, unearned, undeserved kindness. Kindness from the holy, just, good God towards forgetful, rebellious, ungrateful creatures. He could rightly have wiped them out, but instead... He spared them, saying, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's what the next 1,400 years of Passover celebrations were saying to them, too, throughout the Old Testament. It's what the whole sacrificial system with its temple and its priesthood were saying. The cost of sin, the penalty of sin is death, temporal and eternal, now and forever in hell. But sacrifice may be made. Blood may be shed so that sin can be covered, so that it can be atoned for, so that it can be forgiven. And when God sees that blood, He passes over the guilty sinner and counts their debt as paid by another. The problem, though, is that the sacrifices have to keep coming. I mean, people are sinning all the time. In thought, in word, in deed, you, me, them, past, present, future, waking, sleeping, day, night, young, old, sin is a constant variable in our lives, in the lives of every human being on the face of the planet. And so, more blood, and more blood, and more blood, and it never ends. And some innocent animal can't really pay for your sin anyway, can it, for a murderer? And any priestly class that might offer sacrifices for you, well, what good are they really? I mean, they're as sinful as you are. Uh, they, 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 They die like the rest of men, and they're not around forever. These sorts of sacrifices and this sort of priesthood 
It simply doesn't cut it. So, why did God even bother? Why have this Passover picture, sacrifice, feast uh, tradition throughout the history of Israel? And the answer that the Bible gives us is that it illustrated the problem and hinted at the solution. It was a shadow to a coming reality. It was a signpost that pointed to the future. It pointed us, it pointed them to the cross of Jesus Christ, which is the second point this morning, building all around Hebrews 9, and it is simply this. By means of His own blood, Christ secured eternal redemption. Now, that might sound strange, especially if you didn't grow up in a church, but but really it's the same message as before. God is saying, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Only now, it's not the blood of some terrified, witless animal dragged kicking and twisting to the altar. No, it's the blood of His own Son, Jesus, who freely went to the cross and willingly gave up His life. And it's not a sacrifice that must now be made again and again and again every time you sin, leaving a trail of blood splattered across your life. No, it's a sacrifice that was so total, so perfect, so comprehensive and far-reaching that by its single occasion, it can cover once and forever the sins of every man and woman and child who comes under its benefit. He made it once, never to be made again. Once 2,000 years ago on the cross, on the actual occasion of the Jewish Passover, showing that the old Passover was always meant to be pointing to the cross. The everlasting eternal God came into the world. Jesus came, the fullness of God becoming a man. He lived a perfect life, obeying every commandment flawlessly, thought, word, and deed, waking and sleeping as a child and as an adult. And being both pure and innocent, being both man and God, he offered up his body, his blood, as a sacrifice for sinners. So he was crucified. He was spat on. He was mocked. He was stripped. He was beaten. He was blasphemed. He was scourged. He was hated. He was cursed by those whom he created and nailed to a wood of cross. He became the object of his own father's punishing justice. He became the target of holy vengeance. He drank the full cup of divine wrath. God poured it all out on his beloved righteous son, all the torment deserved by those he came to save. It is a horrifying thought. It is a terrible picture. It is a grisly testimony. And yet, it is both wonderful and glorious too, because it was done in love to save the likes of you and me. It says Hebrews, Hebrews 2, Jesus partook in our blood, he became a man. Hebrews 9, 12, Jesus entered once for all into the holy places of heaven, not by the means of blood and go- of goats and calves, but by his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Hebrews 9, 14, if the blood of bulls and goats purifies flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify the conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9, 24 following, Christ has entered not into holy places made by hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have to have suffered repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has offered once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You see, this is what the old Passover was always pointing to, and the basic message is the same. When I see the blood, 
I will pass over you. Only now the message is clearer. It is clarified. And it is is complete. It's in the past tense. God is effectively saying to you, if you are a Christian this morning, the one who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, if if you are that person, he is saying to you, when I saw the blood, the blood of my son, the true Passover lamb, which secures eternal redemption. When I saw that, my judgment passed over you for all time and eternity, and it fell on him instead. So get ready for the promised land. And that should be a great comfort for you if you are a Christian, because no further sacrifices are needed. Even the sins you have not yet committed have been paid for. Judgment has passed you by, It shall never, it can never return because he took it all upon himself and he paid for it in full. So we can say with reverence, he is our hero. What he has done was effective. He served valiantly when he stood in the breach, stood in the gap, shielded us with his body and his blood. But we can also say, yet he is alive. He reigns. And he's returning to take us into that promised land, into heaven one day. But the word of God also speaks to the unbeliever, to the one who's not a Christian, to the one who is a slave to their sin, as it were, still in spiritual Egypt, who has not taken refuge under the blood of the Lamb. If you have not been shielded by the grisly testimony of the cross, shielded like those wounded soldiers trembling in the tent, then the threat to your soul remains because the wrath of God is coming upon the world. Only unlike the story from the Aleutian Islands, God the Avenger is not a murderous soldier. Rather, He is the just and holy and righteous judge. And the ones cowering in fear of that wrath are not the proverbial good guys, the, uh, victims. Rather, they are wicked creatures fully deserving what is coming towards them, fugitives of justice, treasonous rebels, defiled by lies and lusts and idolatries of heart and mind and tongue. And yet even now, there's the memory of one standing in the gap who willingly offered his body as a bloody substitute to turn away the threat of divine punishment. 2,000 years after the cross, God still holds out to you the offer of forgiveness for the evil that you have done in His creation with the life He gave you against His holy word. The great, merciful, wonderful, good, holy, loving, just God actually calls to you in your sins and He says, Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It's a simple call. It's made to you this morning. This is your only hope of salvation of being freed from the judgment of hell and entering the promised rest of heaven. No other sacrifice can be made. No other blood will be acceptable. There is no other way but this way the way of Christ. The blood was shed at the cross. It won't be shed again. So be reconciled to God while there is still time. Won't you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, as we reflect on these things and as we prepare now to take communion. We ask, Lord, that you would lead us further in worship. Help us to examine our hearts. Help us to appreciate the grace of the cross. Help us to respond and help any in our midst who do not yet know you. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.